Hey everyone, it's Conrad Bobby Luck here, CEO of Investors Prime Real Estate and author of Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple. Welcome to today's video on school zones. And I'll tell you one thing honestly, if I had to start over again and go into another major capital city in Australia and not knowing anything about the market, not having any previous due diligence or research or any idea about capital growth suburbs, the number one thing that I would look for is the best, most prestigious schools in terms of ranking, and I would buy a four-bedroom house or a townhouse or a three-bedroom townhouse, depending on the area and the affordability, within the best school zone of that major capital city. I mean, it's probably the easiest way to make money. So if you don't do anything else, any other research, but you use this one simple methodology you can build a whole property portfolio just by following school zones all around Australia, around the major capital cities. And so what I've done today is I'm going to explain the school zones to you. I'm going to go through in detail in Victoria, specifically in Melbourne, the best schools in Melbourne. Um, and also I'm going to show you the, the difference in capital growth potential. And not only that, the difference in price for the same property in a school zone compared to outside a school zone. And I think you'll be blown away. And I'm going to give you at the end the best 10 suburbs in Melbourne in 2021 to 2022 and three that you should be considering if you want to park your money into a school zone. And these suburbs have a really good capital growth. So welcome to today's video. Before we get started, a bit of a personal disclaimer. I've never met you. I don't know your personal situation or your financial status. So this is just purely educational information. Do not act on this information without seeking independent advice from someone that's qualified that has results. That's the key. Now, for those who have never heard me speak before, my background is um, that I've wasted four years of my life at Monash University um, doing a business degree, which consisted of uh, playing pool at the tavern and drinking beer and doing assignments with international students, which is a lot of fun. Then I, I'm also a real estate agent, a mortgage broker, and I started off after that course working for Australian Uni Funds Management in financial planning. The most important thing about myself is that I'm a real property investor. Apart from becoming a real estate agent, um, I'm actually an investor in Melbourne with a large property portfolio. And that, that's the only thing that gives me the credentials really to talk to you guys today about school zones and how to make money. My book, my first book, which is uh, Australian Property Finance Made Simple, um, has become number one bestseller. You can get a copy on bookonfinance.com.au or any good bookshop, including Amazon, Booktopia, etc. And the second one, which just came out last year, has also got number one bestseller, which is Real Estate Investing Made Simple, um, Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple. So you can get a copy of that book as well by going on to Real Estate Made Simple or Amazon or eBay for 10 bucks <laughs> uh, or any other good bookshop. And also I want to thank you guys for following me and, and also buying my books because not only did my uh, real estate book go number one on Amazon as the best seller, at the same time, my finance one was still number eight. And by the way, the finance one was also number one for a long time. So I want to thank you everyone for buying those books. They took me years to write um, and uh, I haven't, uh, you know, everything that I've learned that made me lots of money I've put into those books without holding anything back. So they are a great resource for you guys. Anyway, enough of that. Now, if you want to know how to find the best performing suburbs in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane, there's another video that I have on my YouTube channel, which is simply called the top 10 fundamental things you must understand about a suburb before you invest there. Remember, this whole game is about fundamental analysis. You can back it up with technical analysis, charts and graphs, RP data, but the academics that, that purely make decisions based on uh, for technical analysis, which is charts, graphs and numbers, always fail long term. And they end up investing in crazy suburbs that have no fundamentals. So you've got to do fundamental analysis, street level analysis, which, which what Warren Buffett teaches and probably the most successful investors of all time teach. So remember, Warren Buffett says, be wary of geeks bearing formulas, okay? which means that academics that watch charts and graphs all day always invariably fail in their long-term endeavor in, in, in succeeding in property investing. Most don't even start. They just stick to the stock market. But, but I know a lot of people that have been tam playing around you know, um, with the stock market for 20, 30 years. They've never made any money. It just goes up and down. They make a little bit, then they give it back. There's no system in place. There's nothing. 
where if you look at Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, I mean, the average investment that company has had since the mid 70s or late 70s is 21% per annum. I mean, it's incredible. So obviously the guy is onto something. It's a formula for success. So if you want to watch this video as well, after you watch this video on school zones, you can go back and watch this video, which gives you the 10 more, nine other areas you need to understand about when you're analyzing property. Today is purely about school zones. Now, before we get into school zones, let's talk about some critical factors that are actually responsible for capital growth in Melbourne. And this is the same on Sydney and Brisbane. So it's really the, what I call the lifestyle triangle. And it's really now not so much the distance, but the time that it takes for a person to travel from home to work to school if they have children or lifestyle areas, which is cafes, restaurants, gyms, where they can relax and then back home. Now, obviously with COVID-19, a lot has changed. Most people now work from home. In fact, there's been industries, very successful industries, especially banking and finance, consulting, legal, accounting, marketing, architectural, where people work predominantly from home now. They've set up the Zoom room, as they call it, and they work from home very efficiently, um, and they don't no longer travel to the city. So what has changed in, in real terms in Melbourne, and this is why we've had such a big surge in property numbers, and I've done other videos on the property market and what's happening right now, is that people no longer value the distance from their property to the city because they don't need to drive every day to and from the city. So a lot of people have done, and I'm talking about wealthy people here, and I'm talking about the, not the middle class so much, but the upper class, is they've sold their smaller properties, one, two, two Ks from the city, and now they're going out and getting lifestyle properties 20Ks, 30Ks from the city in the eastern suburbs or the, or the bayside, like places like Balmorris, and they're buying a five, six bedroom house on a thousand square meter block with a pool because now they're spending so much time inside the house, they might need to drive to the city maybe once or twice a month, but really effectively now with all these lockdowns, people are looking for quality of life rather than distance to the city. So that has changed things in Melbourne and, and that's why we've had this massive boom in those blue chip areas that are located 15 to 25 k from the city, especially in the north, south, east, east, um, and the Bayside area of Melbourne. You know, those properties have boomed and I've seen properties sell at, you know, two, 300, 500 above in the reserve. And I'll show you one today on this video. So it's very logical, you know, if you're, if you're home and, and basically you need to drive for 10 minutes to work and then also to pick up the kids another 10 minutes and back home, the quality of your lifestyle is going to be quite high, you know. Um, if you need to drive for an hour to get to work and you're stuck in traffic, you know, every day and then you need to battle the traffic to get your kids from school when you're coming home and you're spending two hours in the car every day or, or, or three, which is insanity, after five days of doing that, you're over it completely, you know, and this is what a lot of people have done, especially in Melbourne, um, in the western suburbs where there is no real way to get across from the city to the western suburbs apart from the Westgate Bridge, which, which becomes a car park at peak hour traffic. So those estates that are very close to the city, 25, 30 k's from the city, um, you know, people are taking an hour, an hour and a half to get back home, even though geographically it's quite closely located. So that's why they're building the tunnel and other, other area, you know, other, um, transport solutions to link the western suburbs to the city in a more efficient way. These are the major in employment hubs in Melbourne after, and basically the red sections represent the majority of employment hubs apart from the central business district. So you can see there, you know, Telmarine Airport obviously has a huge uh, employment hub, Sunshine Footscray, which is semi-industrial, Broadmeadows. And then you have, these tend to be more blue collar um, industries. And same with these, where these tend to be more white collar professionals. These are all business parks and business centers and medical centers. And these are a combination of both. So you can see there's an investor it is quite preferential for you to buy something around an area that has a major employment hub because then you have a constant flow of people that are working with money that can pay your rent. I mean, it doesn't get any more basic than that. Um, see, a lot of people think that everyone works in the city and, and that's not true. Um, in fact, you know, only around 25% of people work in the city, 75% of people don't work in the city and they don't want to work in the city. Um, so, you know, you don't, don't think that the whole game is based on distance to the city. It is not. The game has changed somewhat. It is based on 
high income earners wanting to live in a particular area. That's what it is, supply and demand. So really the definition of capital growth is high income earners, people with very high weekly disposable income. And the way you check income per person, you can go to a website called www.id.com.au, income demographics. So in Melbourne, for example, Richmond has some of the highest income demographics um, you know, out of any suburb, it's 2,500 per person per week, where Melton has the lowest, which is $440 per week per person. So if you're parking your money somewhere, would you park it in Richmond or would you park it in Melton? I mean, it's up to you. And remember, this is not judging people by income. This is purely a game of making money. Remember, all my videos, guys, that I make are not designed to make fun of suburbs or I've got some, you know, people say, oh, I live in, in Point Cook. I know you don't like Point Cook. I don't have any emotional dislike or like about Point Cook. It's a neutral feeling. It's like saying, how do I feel about Amazon or Facebook? I don't have any feeling about Facebook or Amazon. I have shares in Amazon and Facebook because I've made a lot of money out of it, but I, I don't like or dislike the companies. I don't like or dislike virtually any suburb in Melbourne. Maybe there's a couple of exceptions. Um, so purely this, these videos are just purely to, to show you guys where the money is to be made and which areas to avoid. That's all it is. Now, these are the 10, 10 fundamental things you must know about a suburb before you invest there. And you can watch a video on all these, but I'm going to put it in the context of schools. So you need 10 years average capital growth of 10% plus, according to RP data. There are suburbs that are going through gentrification, but it's very difficult to pick those suburbs. So if you're a novice investor, if you've got less than five properties, don't even go there. Just go for the proven methodology of 10, 10 years of 10% capital growth. Household income per week is the key. You've got to have people with high disposable incomes. Low disposable incomes means that rich people do not want to live there, okay? No one from Turek is going to move to Frankston North, okay, or St Albans. It's just not going to happen, okay? So, and if you think, well, St Albans is going to go up in value, yeah, it will in 50 years' time, which is going to be dead by then, okay? So you need to make money in the next two or three years, not in 50 years when you're 95. High demand for housing combined with critical shortage of stock. This is the key, guys. So DSR ratios, demand to supply ratios, which you can go to dsr.com.au. Um, you've got to look at the volume of stock that's coming on the market in the future and currently and how much is the demand. And that's based on search per property. So if you look at Dockland South Bank, it's oversaturated with stock. They're building more and more apartments, about 18,000 apartments right now. You know, there's 60,000 plus on the books. I mean, it's, it is, it's never ending supply with no demand. So the, the return is very low. Um, if you look at places like Armadale, there's virtually no stock on the market. Jump onto realestate.com right now and look at Windsor, Armadale for houses. It's like four or five. So very good area, very good school zone area, very prestigious, safe, no stock on the market. Walk score is the walkability factor. So the closer you get to 100, um, the better, obviously. Target suburb with the highest ranking and best secondary schools, which is, which is what we're going to do today. Um, and I'm going to cover that in detail. And obviously, a lot of these are interlinked with each other. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, for example, Yes, if you look at investment in properties which have um, highest level of development and redevelopment restrictions, a lot of the areas that have the best school zones are also have very high restrictions on building apartments and high density living solutions. And that's a good thing because the less you have in the school zone, the more prestigious it becomes and the more people fight over the stock that's in the market. McKinnon High is a good example. I'm going to use that today to, to show you how that's, that's, um, that's linked. Brand name award winning architects, if it's a brand new property, are targeting the 20, 29 to 35 year old professional. Um, and obviously the reason that I choose to source brand new properties for my clients is because you get maximum depreciation on the building fixtures and fittings. You get massive rental yields and you get very low lo lo land tax. Land tax is based on the land component only. Now, these are the best schools to buy into, school zones to buy into 2021. And you can see there, if you look at this map, Without even look, doing a lot of, this is a helicopter view kind of a, a, a look at the map. Without doing a lot of due diligence, you can see where the highest concentration of the best schools in Melbourne is. Okay, you don't need to be <laughs> a specialist in understanding how to read maps. This is a heat map showing you the best schools in Melbourne. Okay, with the red being obviously the best areas. And there's obviously pockets of schools as well. So you can see there 
that's where they are concentrated. And there is no schools on this side of the city at all that are worth mentioning. There are schools there. Every suburb has a school. You can't have a suburb without a school. Okay. <laughs> um, but we're talking about reality here and making money. Now, this is an air, this is a, um, a screenshot of the uh, zoning for schools. You can see that every suburb has a school zone. Okay. Just so you understand. So people mention, oh, I'm buying a property in Berwick, it's got a school zone. You know, no one cares because every suburb has a school zone, okay? It's a prerequisite. It's like saying I'm buying a car, great, it's got wheels. Oh, wonderful, it's got windows and the windows can go up and down. Yeah, these are standard things for every suburb, okay? So what we're talking about is school zones that make you money. So <laughs> school zones that actually, that actually put more pressure on property prices, therefore if you buy into the area, it goes up in value. You know, so I want to show you that every suburb has a school zone, okay? It's nothing special. Because people say, oh, I'm buying in so-and-so suburb and it's got a school zone. Yeah, but no one cares about that school, okay? <laughs> Melton's got school zones. No one cares about them, <laughs> okay? <laughs> when I say no one cares, it doesn't add value to the property. It doesn't make you more money to buy in the school zone or outside the school zone. Please don't email me from Melton if you live there, okay? I'm not having a go at you. Now, I'm going to use McKinnon High because it's one of the highest ranking public schools in Melbourne. It's got a very strict school zone catchment area, which has just expanded now. If you watch my videos two years ago, I was telling people to, to buy properties in the future expansion zone of McKinnon High with the potential of making a very quick short-term gain in, in properties. I was, in my live events, I was telling people this is the number one area to target. Now, McKinnon High is a public school, and literally, if you're on the wrong side of East Boundary Road, you can't go to McKinnon High. And people are sneaky. They buy investment properties inside the school zone, and they, they use it as a home address. So the principal and teachers will inspect your property, and they want to see where you live before they allow you to go into McKinnon High. It's that level, because people are sneaky. Now, recently, because McKinnon High has done so well and so highly ranked, it has extended its school zone by taking into Mar Mar you know, Moorabbin and other parts of Bentley East, which is not a good thing, by the way, because now what the McKinnon High has done, because she agreed, is, and I understand the function of schools as you expand your campus, you have the capacity to take more people on. The problem is now with McKinnon High is they're taking on people that live in apartments, not detached houses, which was originally where the catchment area was. This was all predominantly detached houses. This area now is much more cheaper than this area, and there's a high density of apartments. So people have lower incomes, and therefore McKinnon's reputation in the future will be diminished severely, in my opinion, because they are now changing the demographics of the students they're attracting to their school. Time will tell. I think this is a bad thing for McKinnon High personally, and I think their ranking will go down severely because of, of the people that they're catching. Now, people that have bought in the, in the school zone here, this is an example of the, the power of school zones. This is from February the 8th, 2021. Marambina house um, tops reserved by 500,000 amid a McKinnon Secondary College um, zone speculation. So this is where this property uh, was sold um, 500000 above reserve to a family because they wanted their kids to be in the McKinnon High catchment area. 500000 above in the reserve. Can you imagine? That's the power of school zones. And so, you know, um, Marubina sellers are on cloud nine after the home sold 510000 above reserve amid speculation it will be zoned for an in-demand new school. And the owners of 12 Wallace Avenue, Morambina, sell their February 6th auction reserve by, at 1.87 million. But at 1.7 opening bid made before the auction has finalized the spill quickly and escalated to 2.38 million top offer. So originally it was 1.87 reserve and it sold for 2.38 million. It's just a normal house. It's nothing special. You know, it's just a location and demand. So once again, think about the people that can afford 2.38 million. So they're obviously good income earners. And then you have a situation where you have very limited stock, and then you have very much competition from people with income to buy that stock, you know? Um, so if you look at the school zones, um, in terms of ranking, you have Biala College in Hawthorne, Mount Scopus, number two in Burwood, also Ballarat, um, Clarendon College, 
um, McRobbs High, which is by scholarship only, Melbourne High, South Yarra, St Kilda East, Turek, um, Keys Borough, Canterbury, Berwick. So you can see that all the suburbs, we have school zones that are the highest ranked school zones. Now, by the way, just because they're the highest ranked school zones, doesn't automatically translate into you're going to make more money in school number one, number two, number three, and then it just descends, okay? This is why people with technical analysis fail because that's an assumption, right? The higher the ranking of the school, the more money I'll make. Wrong. And this is an example of how technical analysis fails and fundamental analysis, street level analysis, always overcomes and supersedes technical analysis, okay? Um, then you've got Q, Burwood, Q, Keysborough, Berwick, Armadale, Turek, Ivanhoe, Brighton, Turek. There's a, there's a repetitive kind of theme here, right? Brighton, Mount Waverley, Armadale, Q, Elston, Week, Hawthorne, Melbourne, Keeler East, Brighton, Shepparton. See, regional towns have very good schools because even in regional centres, there's rich people living in suburbs, right? They all live together. They're all clustering together in a specific area. So you can see there, you know, um, there's a pattern here. Now, these are the best schools to buy into if you want to make the greatest amount of money right now in Melbourne in 2021. The number one school, um, Albert Park College, so 1.75 million house price um, in the zone versus 1.255. So there's a $495,000 difference. So Albert Park is the number one suburb for buying into a school zone. So if you buy in Albert Park, not in the school zone, versus a school zone, there's $500,000 premium that you're paying. Balmoral Secondary College, 1.68 million versus 1.25 outside the school zone, $430,000 difference. And by the way, the capital growth inside the zone is much higher than outside the zone. So even within the suburb, the capital growth for properties is much higher than other properties. And even within the properties themselves, a five bedroom house in a school zone will always outperform a four and a three bedroom house in a school zone, okay? Um, Glen Lavery Secondary College, 1.615 million versus 1.235 million, so $380,000 difference. Baldwin High, 2 million and 5,000 versus 1.8 million, $198,000 difference. Box Hill, 1.41 million versus 1.217 outside the school zone, $193,000 difference. McKinnon Secondary College, 1.58 million versus 1.415 million, 167,000 difference between school zone and non-school zone. So those people that overpaid half a million dollars, I mean, I wasn't there, I don't know, the, in the context of other properties on the market, I'm just saying that, in my opinion, they way overpaid for what they purchased. Now, obviously, the market is very forgiving. Long term, even if you have negative equity in the short term, you're still gonna make money. You can't lose money in Murrumbina, in Bentley East, in Bentley, you're never gonna lose money. You know, as long as you sit it out and wait, it's just impossible. Um, well, no, it is possible, by the way, if you sell at the wrong time, but I'm saying long term, if you hold it for 10 years, you'll make money. Um, Paran High School, 1.7 million versus 1.5 million, so $147,000 difference. Camberwell High, 2.16 million versus 2 million, $93,000 difference. East Doncaster Secondary College, Doncaster, sorry, um, 1.3 million versus 1.22 million, so $83,000 difference. Mount Waverley Secondary College, 1.275 million versus 1.2 million, so $75,000 difference. Frankston High, 785,000 versus 720, which is $65,000 difference. Um, Mill Park Secondary College, so you want to get to 38,000, so Mill Park's not even worth investing in. I would never put, I would never buy anything in Mill Park anyway because there's no capital growth there. But even with the school zone, there's no, virtually no difference. I mean, 38 grand, come on, that's, I mean, anything under 50,000, it's not even, not even worth looking at. Um, Melbourne Girls College in Richmond, 1.85 versus 1.82, same thing. There's, the, the margin's not great enough to, to justify it. Morialek's $12,000 12, difference. Morialek is a very good suburb for long-term capital growth. It's going through gentrification. It was always the ugly duckling of the Bayside, and now it's got all the cafes, restaurants. You know, it's really, really, in the last 10 years, I've seen so much money going to Morialek. Um, but in terms of schools and non schools, there's virtually no difference. And that's from REIV for the year of December 20. So as of last year, um, this data was captured. So it gives you a bit of an understanding of the difference between school zones and suburbs. 
So I, like I said at the beginning of the video, if I was going into a major capital city like Brisbane and Sydney and I had no knowledge about anything, what I would do is find out this, this not, not the actual ranking of schools, but the difference between the prices of a school zone versus outside of the school zone, and I would just go for the properties inside the school zone in the very best schools in the, in the major capital city. You can't go wrong. So, I mean, if that's, that's probably the best single methodology that I would think of using if I had no knowledge absolutely of a city. You know, zero knowledge, no access to any kind of data. I would go to the equivalent of the RAIV, which is the Real Estate Institute of Victoria or Real Estate Institute of New South Wales. Say, can you give me a list of schools and the difference between school zone and non-school zone houses the last 10 years? Go for number one and start buying properties. Doesn't get easier than that, guys, you know. Now, if you like that video, um, I hope you got value out of it. Um, I encourage you to book a 60-minute strategy session with myself. And what I do, by the way, is I run a real estate company in St Kilda, which is where I am right now in Alma Road, and I source properties uh, in the highest capital growth suburbs in Melbourne. So in Melbourne, there's 420 suburbs. There's about 60 new ones that no one really cares about because they're just cow paddocks being turned into suburbs, but there's 420 actual functioning suburbs. And out of the 420, about 220 double every 10 years and 220 don't double every 10 years, give or take. There's obviously a spillover effect. I know 220 plus 220 is, is 440, and I said 4, 420. But the last 20 spill over to in and out because they're at that 9.8%, you know, 10.1. Um, anyway, out of those 420 suburbs, there's 50 suburbs that do consistently perform a 10, 12% per annum. And I source brand new, only brand new, off the plan, townhouses and detached houses in those suburbs for investors who want to do the buy and hold long-term strategy. So passive accumulation, buy and hold, blue chip tenants, just buy the property, get your taxes. They're all cash flow positive from day one, by the way, right now, because the interest rates are 2% and we're getting rental yields of 3.75 to 4.25. So all the properties that I'm sourcing, all the townhouses and houses are cash flow positive from day one. They're putting money in your pocket so that you don't need to, to have any money to actually supplement the property in any way, shape or form. Um, but they are expensive, you know, two bedrooms are starting at 750 now, three bedrooms are going from about 1.1 million. But if you want that as a service, I can do a whole plan around you accumulating those properties and eventually replacing your income or just building up a massive property empire. Um, remember, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And if you haven't got a plan, then it's going to be very difficult for you to accomplish your goals as a property investor. Most people when they start off investing in property do this. They just go all around the place, they make mistakes, they buy the wrong type of property, wrong structure, they talk to the wrong people, they talk to their neighbours, their parents, people that are broke, and then they eventually get to be and say, gee, now after 20 years, I know what to do. Well, the best thing to do is go and get a coach who's done this before and can get you from A to B in a very short period of time with the least amount of effort um, with no mistakes. And that's what I do with my clients. So in an hour strategy session, you're going to walk away with a clear understanding of the strategies and actions that you need to take in order to bridge the gaps between where you are financially and where you want to be in the future. Okay? I'm going to give you an introduction to my whole team of experts that I use in the industry, which is my accountant, my lawyer, my financial planner, mortgage broker, insurance specialist, property manager. And by the way, they're all in this book as well. So if you want to know who the companies are that I use personally in Melbourne to build up my property portfolio, they're all in this book. They've actually contributed a chapter to this book um, right down to quantity surveying, um, which, which is BMT, which I use personally for my property portfolio. You get priority access to my developments that I source. They're all off the mark, off, off market, so you never see them on realestate.com on domain. And just, just to get that network, guys, is the key. Because remember, ultimately, your network will determine your net wealth. You know, um, you have to be surrounded by people that are smarter than you, that are wealthier than you. If you're the smartest person in your group of, of people, in your, if your network, then you're in trouble, okay? You've got to be the poorest, the dumbest, not the dumbest, but the least informed person in your network. That's the key because they'll elevate you to the next level, 
And that's one of the secrets of success, hanging around with people that are better than you. It's like playing tennis or any sport or golf or kickboxing. If you are training with champions, your level of skill goes up. If you're playing with a nine-year-old, nothing's going to happen. You're not learning anything. You're just wasting time. So the, the journey of building wealth through property is based on strategy. You've got to get the strategy on paper first and with extreme clarity where you're starting out, where you want to go, and how you can re-engineer that back into property acquisition. It's a, it's a paint by the number system, guys. There's no, there's very little, um, creativity involved. It's, it's almost boring once you understand how structured it is, but most people don't even know how to do it and they just, you know, they just don't ever get there because there's no destination locked in and they don't understand how to actually structure a real plan. Um, so to qualify for this single one hour session, there's no charge by the way, it's free. As a single person, you need to be on a minimum of $95,000 per annum and have about 112000 in equity, which means you can buy a property for around $700,000, which I can just get you into right now in Melbourne. If you're a couple, you need to be on an income of about one, 120, 140, um, with about 112,000 in equity, which means you can just get into a property for 700,000 as well. If your income's lower than that, I won't be able to help you with property at all. So, um, because I don't source anything below 700,000. It's very rare if something comes up below 700,000. Um, if you've been to my live events, you can just get this form and send it to me. Or if you've never been to a live event, just email me directly, conrad at investorsprime.com.au and just say strategies requesting complimentary 60 minute strategy session and I'll respond and I'll just um, book you in. If you want to include your financials, that's fine. People have sent me Excel spreadsheets with the current property holdings. No problem. I can then read that information, prepare for our meeting. If you're just starting out, you've got one house, you don't need to send me anything. But you've got three investment properties. If you want to show me your equity position in each property, the, the interest rate, the rental, yeah, absolutely. Attach it to the actual email. It will just make my job easier. We can just get through the information faster. So once again, just email me directly, conrad at investorsprime.com.au, and I can book that in with you. I do get booked out for about two or three weeks ahead of time, so um, I only do two of these per day because I'm spending the majority of my time with existing clients and making them very wealthy. So um, I do 10 of these sessions per week only, so there is a bit of a waiting list, but the sooner you book in, the sooner we can catch up and talk. And that's it from me, guys. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you um, for following me on YouTube, and I hope you subscribe to my channel. Uh, this is Conrad Bobby Lake, and I'll see you on the inside.